so the second component of treatment for differentiated thyroid cancer is a radioactive iodine therapy which includes the radioactive iodine ablation the radioactive iodine scan the whole body scan so first let's understand that in which thyroid cancers this radioactive iodine therapy would be useful among the differential thyroid cancers the radioactive iodine therapy is useful for papillary thyroid cancers it is useful for follicular thyroid cancers and some cases of herthal cell carcinoma not all cases but some cases of herthal cell carcinoma because we know that herthal cell carcinoma is much less radioactive iodine avid as compared to the papillary and the follicular cancers and definitely radioactive iodine therapy has no role as far as the medullary thyroid cancers are concerned so no role in medullary thyroid cancers and no role in undifferentiated thyroid cancers like the anaplastic carcinoma now what are the objectives what are the aims you know uh, when we are doing a radioactive iodine therapy as far as radioactive iodine therapy is concerned the first objective is to pick up to detect any remnant normal thyroid tissue to pick up or detect any normal thyroid tissue any remnant normal thyroid tissue you know what can happen is around 5 to 10 percent cases even when we have done a total thyroidectomy you know some remnant normal thyroid tissue may be left behind now why this is important you know uh, to look for remnant normal thyroid tissue because in presence of remnant normal thyroid tissue the metastases or the recurrences you know they will not take up the radioactive iodine we know that the normal follicular cells they have a you know higher uptake of radioactive iodine as compared to the tumor cells so you know we want that there should not be any functional uh, tissue in the neck there should not be any normal thyroid tissue in the neck for a better utilization of the iodine scan in the post operative period and you know absence of this normal thyroid tissue in the neck also is important for better you know utilization of thyroglobulin for monitoring these patients you know of thyroid cancer in the post operative period that is why it is important to detect this remnant normal thyroid tissue and if present you have to ablate it and the second we say objective of radioactive iodine therapy is definitely to detect and to ablate to detect and ablate any metastases any recurrences which cannot be handled surgically now what are the you know patients which are candidates for a whole body iodine scan first thing you have to understand is that in the present scenario or as per the current guidelines every patient of thyroid cancer after surgery does not require a radioactive iodine scan or does not require a whole body iodine scan you know earlier definitely yes it was done in all patients but in as per the recent guidelines a whole body iodine scan or a radio, a radioactive iodine scan is mainly required in patients who have a high risk of recurrence those who have a high risk of recurrence and in some selected patients with intermediate risk of recurrence with intermediate risk of recurrence there is no role of this radioactive iodine scan in patients who have a low risk of recurrence Okay, that's the first thing to understand. So, what are these patients who are high risk of recurrence, or in other words, which are the patients which are candidates for this whole body iodine scan, and if required, a radioactive iodine ablation. So, whole body iodine scan is recommended in patients who have a tumor size of more than four centimeters, patients who have a tumor with extra thyroidal extension. that means uh, again it is t3 t4 disease patients with t3 t4 disease you have to go for a post operative you know whole body iodine scan along with that at times if the tumor is less than 4 cm but associated with the aggressive histology aggressive histology in those patients also we should go for a radioactive iodine scan or whole body scan then patients with n1 disease when there is clinical or sonographic evidence of enlarged central mediastinal or you know lateral lymph nodes so any of these lymph nodes are found clinically or sonography they found to be enlarged n1 disease both n1a and n1b they are also candidates for a whole body iodine scan patients with metastasis metastases which are presenting either in the form of symptoms so they are symptomatic metastases or they are presenting in the form of a persistently elevated persistently elevated thyroglobulin persistently elevated thyroglobulin we'll talk about thyroglobulin what's the role of thyroglobulin what's the importance of thyroglobulin i'll talk after this and you know plus one more indication is presence of bulky central lymph node disease 
bulky neck disease bulky central neck disease or bulky central lymph disease what do we mean by bulky central lymph disease if on histopathological examination more than 5 lymph nodes on histopathological examination more than 5 lymph nodes are positive for metastasis then also i'll need a whole body adenine scan so another indication can be more than 5 central lymph nodes are positive for metastasis then also we need to go for a whole body adenine scan now what is the time and the prerequisites required for this whole body adenine scan the time is the preferred time is around 4 to 6 weeks after surgery so you don't do it immediately after surgery it is done 4 to 6 weeks after surgery and what are prerequisites before you do this scan you know we all know that all these differential thyroid cancers they're going to take up radioactive iodine and that will be under the influence of tsh so we want a good amount of TSH in the blood because under the influence of TSH, they're going to take up this radioactive iodine. So that is why the prerequisite is that the TSH level in the blood should be at least more than 20 milli international units per liter. Some books write 30 milli international units per liter, but majority of the books write that it should be more than 20 milli international units per liter. And to achieve this, the patient has to be kept on a low iodine diet at least for two weeks prior to the scan. Two weeks prior to the scan, you have to keep the patient low iodine diet. The patient, the thyroxine should be stopped and it should be stopped at least four to six weeks prior to the scan, the thyroxine. Only when thyroxine will get stopped, you know, the TSL level is going to rise. In case the patient is not able to tolerate the symptoms and signs of hypothyroidism because of stopping thyroxine, then we can start the patient on T3. But T3 also should be stopped at least two weeks prior to thyroid scan. It should also be stopped two weeks prior to the scan. And in some patients who are not able to tolerate hypothyroidism, another option is that we can go for recombinant TSH and the recombinant TSH should be started at least 48 hours before the scan. It should be started at least 48 hours before the scan and definitely but recombinant TSH is a costly option. So these are the prerequisites which we need to fulfill before or we need to carry out before we go for a whole body iodine scan. Now what's the protocol of this whole body iodine scan? How do we do it? How do we interpret the results? What is the protocol? So, you know, the scan is done with either iodine-123 or a low dose of iodine-131 that is around 1 to 3 millicuries. Okay. So, before we go for a whole body iodine scan, we do a screening radioactive iodine scan. You go a screening scan, so a screening radioactive iodine scan. And a screening scan is mainly to look for any remnant normal thyroid tissue. It is done to look for any remnant normal thyroid tissue. Okay. Now, I've told you why we want to look for remnant normal thyroid tissue, why it is important that there should not be any remnant normal thyroid tissue. So, what you would do is you give this radioactive iodine, either iodine 123 or iodine 131 in low dose, and 24 hours after, after giving this radioisotope, 24 hours after that, we measure the, we say we measure the activity. You measure the activity after 24 hours. We measure the uptake after the 24 hours. So normally, you know, after total thyroidectomy, after total thyroidectomy, normally the uptake should be less than 1%. It should be less than 1%. In case it is more than 1% or we find a hot area in the neck, we find a hot area in the neck, then it, that indicates that there is presence of remnant normal thyroid tissue. This present normal remnant normal thyroid tissue is present in the neck. And once we detect this remnant normal thyroid tissue in the neck, this has to be ablated. So if we find this within 72 hours, within 72 hours, it should be ablated with iodine 131 and the dose is 30 to 50 millicuries. The dose for ablating this remnant normal thyroid tissue, this is important to remember, that is around 30 to 50 millicuries. Okay. So you do a screening radioactive iodine scan. If you, uh, you know, if you pick up that there's remnant normal thyroid tissue, I told you how do you pick it up? In that case, that has to be ablated with the 30 with 30 to 50 millicuries of iodine 131. So the uh, dose for remnant ablation is 30 to 50 millicuries. Once the remnant thyroid tissue has been ablated or there is no remnant normal thyroid tissue, then you go for a whole body iodine scan. Now, when you do a whole body iodine scan, on whole body iodine scan, if you find any uptake, which may be suggestive of metastasis, in that case, that has to be ablated again with iodine-131. So, you have to carry out a radioactive iodine ablation with iodine-131. And now, what is the dose? Now, the dose for ablation of these metastases will be higher. Now, the dose is around 50 to 100 millicuries. The dose for ablation is 50 to 100 millicuries. Other scenario can be you do a whole body iodine scan and 
on whole body and scan there is no uptake there is no uptake in that case you keep you keep the patient on tsh suppression you keep them in tsh suppression and keep the patient in follow up i'm going to talk about both of them after this how do you follow up the patient and what's the role of tsh suppression we'll talk about this fine so that is as far as the protocol of the you know radioactive iodine scan and radioactive therapy is concerned post operatively in these patients of differentiated thyroid cancer now there's one more important thing at times what you will find is you do the whole body iodine scan but it is negative but the thyroglobin level is increased then it is said that in these patients one dose of iodine 131 around 100 microcuries should be still given to the patient so that is as far as you know the uh, role of radioactive iodine therapy is concerned radioactive iodine, uh, ablation is concerned then the third component of treatment for thyroid cancer is tsh suppression now what is the role of tsh suppression and how do we do it we all know that these differential thyroid cancers they grow under the influence of tsh so to prevent their growth to prevent any recurrences to prevent any metastasis we have to suppress the level of tsh we have to keep the level of tsh in blood low and this will be done by high dose thyroxine by giving high dose thyroxine to the patient so high dose thyroxine will not only suppress the level of tsh and it is also going to replace the thyroid hormone after a total thyroidectomy now how much suppression has to be done that varies that is not fixed for every patient that varies varies depending upon what is the risk of recurrence as per the american thyroid association guidelines we can stratify the patient with thyroid cancers of this differential thyroid cancer to three groups depending on the risk of recurrence they may be high risk different thyroid cancers they may be intermediate risk or they may be low risk so the amount of suppression will depend upon patient falls into which category for high risk different thyroid cancers the suppression should be such that the tsh level should be less than 0.1 milli international units per liter for intermediate risk thyroid cancers different thyroid cancers the suppression should be such uh, suppression should be such that the tsh level in blood is 0.1 to 0.5 milli international units per liter and in low risk ones the level of tsh should be 0.5 to 2 milli international units per liter so these values are already important so you know higher the risk of recurrence more the suppression lower should be the tsh level in the blood so that are three important components of treatment of thyroid cancer apart from this there's one more important thing we have to talk about is the role of thyroglobulin in monitoring a patient of thyroid cancer post operatively you know in monitoring the patient of thyroid cancer we have a important investigation important marker that is thyroglobulin now what is thyroglobulin all of us know thyroglobulin is a glycosylated protein it's a glycosylated protein which is mainly find in the colloid in the follicles and a very small level of you know uh, thyroglobulin you can find in the blood normally but the thyroglobulin level in increased levels can be found in the blood in patients of these differentiated thyroid cancers that is why thyroglobulin is a important tumor marker for these differentiated thyroid cancers but there are two three important things related to thyroglobulin which i like to highlight here first thing is that there is no role no role of pre operative measurements of the levels of thyroglobulin so no role of pre operative measurements of the level of thyroglobulin it has to be measured mainly post operatively and when we measure thyroglobulin levels we can have two types of thyroglobulin levels they can be a unstimulated thyroglobulin level or they can be a stimulated thyroglobulin level unstimulated level of thyroglobulin and a stimulated level of thyroglobulin what is unstimulated level you know if we just go and measure level of thyroglobulin that is unstimulated level stimulated level is something which is stimulated by tsh so to measure stimulated level what do we do is we tell the patient to stop thyroxine at least 2 to 3 weeks prior to measuring the level of thyroglobulin and then you measure the levels that is what is called stimulated thyroglobulin level and it is a stimulated level which is always more important which is always much more sensitive as compared to the unstimulated level okay third important thing regarding thyroglobulin in some patients there can be presence of anti thyroglobulin antibodies they can be presence of anti thyroglobulin antibodies and these anti thyroglobulin antibodies they can interfere with the assessment with the measurement of the thyroglobulin levels so patients who have a high level of anti thyroglobulin antibodies you know the thyroglobulin level when you measure can be falsely low it can be falsely low if you measure the levels of thyroglobulin okay so that is why you know whenever we are measuring the levels of thyroglobulin in the post operative period in follow up period along with the thyroglobulin level we should also check for the anti thyroglobulin antibodies 
Okay, that's again I'll discuss when I go to follow up. Now, what are the levels of thyroglobulin which are you know important to know? That what level of thyroglobulin indicates that yes, the, there's a good response to treatment, and what level of thyroglobulin is alarming. Now it is said that in case the unstimulated thyroglobulin level is less than 0.2 nanograms per ml and the stimulated level is less than 1 nanogram per ml with a negative imaging, it suggests an excellent response to the treatment. That is an excellent response to the treatment. But in case the stimulated thyroglobulin level is more than 2 nanogram per ml or the unstimulated level is more than 0.5 nanograms per ml, then that indicates a recurrent or a persistent disease. That indicates a recurrent or a persistent disease. So, these levels are important. Stimulated level more than 2 nanogram per ml, that is more sensitive. Unstimulated more than 0.5, so stimulated definitely is more important. So, that is a role of thyroglobulin in monitoring a patient of differentiated thyroid cancer. Now, once you have completed the treatment for thyroid cancer, how do you follow up the patient? Now, for follow up, we mainly do two investigations. One is thyroglobulin levels in the blood. And definitely along with thyroglobulin, we'll always go for anti-thyroglobulin antibodies that I've told you earlier as well. And along with that, we do an imaging that is ultrasound of the neck. What's the frequency? We do this initially at six monthly period and then annually for three to five years. Now, when we do these, you know, when we do these thyroglobin levels or we do the ultrasound neck, if any of them is abnormal, any of them is abnormal, that means the thyroglobin level is increasing or there's some abnormal finding on the ultrasound neck, the next step has to, to is to be to go for a radioactive iodine scan or to go for a whole body iodine scan. To go for a whole body iodine scan. Okay. Now, two things can happen on this whole body iodine scan. On this whole body iodine scan, there may be a positive uptake. You may find some positive uptake, which is indicative of yes, recurrences or metastasis somewhere. In case you find a positive uptake, that has to be ablated now with radioactive iodine 131. So, that has to undergo radioactive ablation with iodine 131. Second scenario can be the thyroid level is increasing, it is abnormal. You did a radioactive iodine scan, but the whole body scan is negative. There is no uptake on this whole body iodine scan. Now, what do, what do you mean by this? What is happening here? What is happening probably here is, you know, the tumor is getting de-differentiated. It is no more radioactive iodine evid, and that is why it is not able to take up this radioactive iodine. Okay, thyroid level is elevated, but radioactive iodine scan is negative. That means it is getting de-differentiated. So, what do we do in these patients? In these patients, very important is the next step of management should be to go for a PET scan. Next step in management should be to go for a PET scan. So, that is something very, very important and commonly as an MCUs also, this flow chart is very important. So, thyroid level, level elevated, but a negative scan, the next step in management has to be PET scan. You have to go for PET scan because these tumors have de-differentiated. They will not be picked up now on radioactive scan. So, you have to pick it up on a PET scan. The recurrence or the metastasis has to be picked up on the PET scan. If you do a thyroid level and the ultrasound neck, if both of them are normal, there is no abnormality in any of them. Both of them are normal, the thyroid level, thyroglobin levels are normal, ultrasound neck is also normal, it doesn't show any abnormality. In this case, you continue with TSH suppression and keep the patient in the follow-up. The follow-up which we have been doing, keep the patient follow-up and continue TSH suppression. That is as far as the follow-up of a patient which is also very important once you have completed the treatment. And this is the complete treatment for a or complete treatment algorithm for differentiated thyroid cancers. With this, we will go and see some you know, important MCQs which have been asked in previous years related to these uh, topic, related to this treatment of differentiated thyroid cancers.